I'm really excited to be talking today about um, birth-related emergencies, the question of what if something happens. Um, I hear that so much, which is so understandable. I feel like when I first announced that I was planning to have home births, one of the things I heard people say to me the most was, oh, you're so brave. Aren't you afraid that something will happen? Or I could never forgive myself if something were to go wrong. So there's this um, concern that by birthing outside of the hospital that we are perhaps putting ourselves into situations that are dangerous or at least into a situation where if something were to go wrong, there would not be the appropriate type of care available to make sure that that emergency could be dealt with. And I hear this all the time. Um, and it makes sense. I think that the majority of us have grown up um, assuming and I'm correlating safety with hospital and medical professionals, right? So even if you're choosing a home birth and you feel pretty good about it, I find that this concern can linger, this concern that what if something goes wrong? Um, and it is normal. And I think it's normal to feel that and have that fear, even if you are planning to give birth in a hospital. But what we need to do is is really break this down because <clears throat> there's so the statement, what if something happens is so loaded. It's so loaded. So let's break this down. Okay. Something. <laughs> what do we mean by that? What do we mean by something? What if something happens? What kind of something? And often if you ask somebody who says the sentence, what they do mean by something, they probably can't tell you. Or they'll say something like, well, my sister-in-law's baby had its cord wrapped around its neck and had to be born by via emergency cesarean. Or baby's heart rate tanked and she got rushed into surgery and if she hadn't been at the hospital, she would have died. Okay, so the truth is that First of all, we're not clear on what the something is. What is exactly the birth emergency that we're worried about might happen at home? And then the second part of the sentence is if it happens. So birth emergencies, they do sometimes just happen out of seemingly nowhere. But the truth is also that there are ways to prevent them, ways to predict them. And sometimes the hospitals themselves contribute to causing these things. So they don't just happen in a vacuum out of thin blue nothing. So um, we need to really break this down. So what I wanna talk about today is I wanna name the some things that could happen. I wanna give them names for you, talk about how prevalent they are, and then we're gonna also talk about how those things get handled in a home birth situation. Um, because you'll be, I think, hopefully happy to hear that most of them can be. And even the ones that can't be, there's usually, usually sufficient time to get to a hospital for care. So let's break this down. All right, the first, first I'm going to tell you three birth-related emergencies that pop up during labor that are the most common. And even though I'm saying the word common, it's still pretty rare statistically. <laughs> so don't get panicky. Number one would be... Um, uh, a baby that needs help breathing. So a baby that is born just not easily or spontaneously making respiratory effort. And this can be seen by the baby's tone it might be kind of like floppy instead of like the, uh, pulled in limbs and the clenched fists. It might also be um, the color of the baby is off or that the baby is um, not even grimacing or making any facial expressions. There's ways to tell this baby is not transitioning very well to life outside the womb. Um, now the prevalence of this statistically is that five to 10% of deliveries will include a baby that has some trouble adjusting. So 5% will probably, or sorry, 10% might need just some gentle stimulation, um, being dried off. Um, and just a couple little prompts to kind of say, Hey, you're here. It's time to breathe. And then of and then five percent might require what we call positive pressure ventilation, which is or PPV, which just means helping the baby breathe, helping them inflate their lungs for the first time with air by using usually a bag and mask, but it can also be done with one's mouth. So that is <clears throat> something. This is something that happens, and hospitals have complicated um, <laughs> systems to deal with it. They usually have a whole team to do um, neonatal resuscitation. That's the name of the method used to help a baby breathe. Um, 
when it's necessary. But midwives also are trained in neonatal resuscitation. Um, there are training programs for this. Midwives recertify for it every two years. They have to in most cases in order to maintain their certification and or licensure. So they know their way around this. They carry the bag and mask. They carry um, tools for suctioning mucus. And they, many of them also carry oxygen um, in case blow by oxygen is necessary. So this can be dealt with at home, friends. Um, the second emergency that might come up is a mom who bleeds too much, which is also known as postpartum hemorrhage, um, which is um, by the books is defined as 500 milliliters or more of blood loss. And so um, I say by the books because this is, there's different ways to look at what constitutes a, a true postpartum hemorrhage. So in the hospital, what would they do? Well, this is a very in-depth topic actually, um, because first you have to assess what's causing the, the hemorrhage. Is it a tear? Is it because there's retained placenta? Um, is it because the uterus isn't clamping down? What is the origin of the blood? What's causing it? And then they have to take the appropriate steps depending on which thing is causing it. Um, but a midwife also is trained in all of these things. She should know, will know because of her training, um, how to diagnose and assess a postpartum hemorrhage. Now, um, I am actually doing a workshop a week from today at one o'clock called Postpartum Hemorrhage Workshop. It's a really creative name, isn't it? <laughs> but um, so I would highly encourage you if you want to go deeper into this topic, since I don't have time to cover it all right here, I will put a link um, below this video to the registration page for that. It's a week from today. If you can't make it live, there will be a recording. So please sign up for that. But what I need you to hear right now is just that midwives know how to deal with this. And even if um, a drug is needed to help the mom stop bleeding, um, in many states now, midwives are permitted to carry uh, um, Pitocin and Cytotec, which are two drugs that are anti-hemorrhagic. So they stop bleeding. Um, there are also non medical ways to deal with that, that midwives are well-versed in if they're not allowed to carry the actual drugs. And if a midwife is very concerned about your bleeding and is trying things to slow it herself and it's not working and she doesn't have permission or access to the medications, then a uh, transfer to the hospital would be required. <clears throat> but she'll know how to keep you stable until they can get you there too. The next emergency that is common and <laughs> is a stuck baby a baby that uh, has what we call shoulder dystocia, which basically just means that the baby's shoulder gets hooked on the pelvic inlet or outlet so that it can't get through. So there are ways for a midwife to be able to tell that this is happening, which is usually the baby's head will begin crowning, will come out to about the chin, and then instead of coming out further at the next push, it will what we call turtle. It'll like come back inside that turtling is a big indication that the baby is hung up and stuck by the shoulder. So um, there are maneuvers that a midwife will do, starting with just position change for the mom to widen the pelvis, the pelvic outlet, so that the baby's shoulder can just naturally slip past the place where it's stuck. And if those position changes don't work, there are also maneuvers that midwives are trained in to reach inside and hook <clears throat> a shoulder um, and rotate the baby away and off of the place where it is hooked up. So this is obviously a very brief description of what they do. Um, but again, it is something that a midwife knows how to deal with at home. And they honestly, I don't think the hospital would have much more to offer to you than a midwife at home would in this case. Um, they have about five minutes to get the baby unstuck, after which time um, it concerns with oxygen deprivation and therefore potential brain damage set in. But it's estimated that less than 1% of births include shoulder dystocia. So this is very rare. I also need you to know that it is not necessarily connected to the size of your baby. Um, people think, oh, I'm growing a big baby. My baby's going to get stuck. Not necessarily. It is not, it's not like a big baby means you're at higher risk of shoulder dystocia. And babies get stuck even when they are not necessarily huge. It's more about uh, position than it is about bigness. <laughs> so if you're being told that your big baby means you're going to have a shoulder dystocia, please don't automatically believe that. Okay, so those are the, the big three somethings. When we say something might go wrong, those are the three somethings that are most likely to happen. 
Um, and I hope that I've shown you in this brief conversation that most, or that your midwife is almost certainly well-trained in knowing how to do these things. There are a couple of more that I wanna cover that are even more rare than those big three. One is placental abruption. Placental abruption is when basically the placenta begins to detach from the um, wall of the uterus during labor. Now what's wrong with that is that if the placenta is detached from you, it is no longer able to be getting oxygen and blood supply from your body to then give to your baby through the cord. So this is a life-threatening thing for the baby um, and can be for the mom as well. It is very serious. Usually you can see it coming because there will be excessive bleeding during labor. Now, a little bit of blood during labor is definitely within the range of normal. In fact, as you get very close to your baby being born and your cervix is dilating, um, there will be some blood with that, um, bloody mucus, a little bit of trickle. Um, but if you're getting <laughs> a lot of blood sooner than when birth is imminent, that can be a sign that the placenta is detaching. And then the baby's heart rate will probably begin to be affected, obviously. So in this emergency, your midwife would have to move very quickly to get you to higher level care. This is usually, or actually probably almost it always, <laughs> a true reason for an emergency cesarean. This is not one of those ones where you can negotiate, well, just let me labor a little longer. No, you, you don't have time. You need to get your baby out because the placenta is no longer providing life to your baby. <laughs> it needs to be outside of the womb. Um, so the prevalence of that is about 1%, so about the same as a breech birth. But that's what I read today when I was doing research on prevalence statistics. But to me, I would imagine it's even lower than that. Um, okay, last one I wanted to touch on today was cord prolapse. Cord prolapse means that the baby's umbilical cord emerges through the vaginal canal ahead of the baby's head or butt, <laughs> if it's a breech baby. So the placenta comes out first or not the placenta, the cord comes out first. And the reason that that is a problem is because if the cord is dangling there in the vaginal canal and then the baby's head comes down and presses, it can compress the cord between the wall of the vagina and the head and thereby cutting off, again, the oxygen supply to the baby. So this is also life-threatening to the baby. If the baby's head is like literally coming out, is already on the perineum and crowning and the cord is right there beside it, like sometimes you can get the mom to just push really fast and finish up the process ASAP so that the cord compression doesn't last long enough to do any damage. But if the cord is, comes out well before the head does, um, this is extremely dangerous. And what would need to happen is that the mom would need to get on her hands and knees with her, well, actually <laughs> chest with her butt up in the air as high as she can so that gravity is encouraging the baby to not go down into her vaginal canal. And usually the midwife will reach inside and help hold the baby's head up and off the cord so that no cord compression happens. And then simultaneously, an ambulance would be called and you would ride to the hospital in the ambulance in that position with the midwife continuing to hold your baby's head up off the cord. Yes, excruciatingly uncomfortable, but necessary to save life. And then when you got to the hospital, you would have a cesarean in that case as well. The prevalence of that is 0.1% to 0.6%. Very, very, very rare. So those are the big five that I wanted to touch on. There are other things that sometimes come up in labor that are problematic, um, but the ones I just discussed are more of the sudden onset ones, the ones that are hard to see coming. You wouldn't necessarily be able to predict that they're gonna happen until they're happening. Um, you might have an inkling based on certain risk factors, um, but they're pretty unpredictable. There's others that might come up that are um, more predictable, like an infection or um, baby's heart rate just not doing well or mother's blood pressure slowly coming up um, to a point where it's no longer safe level. Um, but those things, or maternal exhaustion where the mom's just spent, she's just done. Um, those things usually you can see coming enough in advance that you have time to kind of negotiate a non-ambulatory transfer to the hospital um, after having a conversation about maybe we need to make this change. It's not like a quick hustle, like screaming, like you're passing out kind of thing. It's not, <laughs> it's not like TV drama <laughs> at all. It's more of a um, carefully considered conversation and decision-making process followed by action. 
Um, so some, sometimes that's the case too. I think we tend to picture like high drama and it's, it's not usually that way. Even um, like <laughs> a baby who's not born breathing and a mom who's bleeding too much when every time I've seen those handled in a home birth setting, even that is not high drama, my friends. The midwives are confident and peaceful and have clear action and it's not screaming, it's not, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's even that is handled really peacefully. Um, the other thing I wanted to just touch on here is that some of these things that happen in labor that are problematic may in fact be caused or at least uh, encouraged to happen by hospitals. <laughs> so for instance, a baby that is stuck <laughs> in a mom who has been on an epidural and therefore can't move her body to allow a bigger inlet or a bigger um, pelvis outlet and is laying on her back where her tailbone was smashed up. You know what I mean? That can lead to a stuck baby when really the baby wouldn't probably be stuck and it might not even be a true shoulder dystocia <laughs> if she could move around and get into a more favorable position um, and have um, more room for her baby to come out. So that's one example of how a hospital can contribute to it. Similarly, um, really intense contractions caused by Pitocin use, because um, Pitocin induced contractions are much, much, much more um, hard and relentless than natural contractions are. So that can cause um, sometimes like an increased risk of placental abruption. So even when I read you these statistics at the prevalence of these different emergencies, I personally very much would love to see the statistics on the prevalence of those emergencies and non-hospital births. But I'm almost sure these statistics I have are from hospital births because there's just not that many people doing research on home births because I don't think that's where the money is. <laughs> Um, so it's worth just noting that sometimes the emergencies that we want hospitals to rescue us from may also be caused by the hospital. So when you move out of the hospital setting, you're creating an entirely different ecosystem and environment in which the um, vulnerability to some of these complications is reduced and therefore you also are less likely to need the hospital to resolve them, right? So. Um, again, we can dig in a lot deeper to this. I'm doing that paid workshop a week from today on postpartum hemorrhage, so we can go a lot more in depth on that. And I'm thinking about, I'm um, playing with the idea of in the future doing a workshop on shoulder dystocia and another one on um, neonatal resuscitation at home. So if those are something you'd be interested in, I'd love to know that as well. But for now, make sure you sign up for the postpartum hemorrhage workshop <coughs> next Friday. If you can't watch it live, there will be a recording. So again, I'll drop that link below this video. Um, so next time somebody asks you, what if something happens? You can confidently say that you know what the somethings are, that they don't necessarily just happen, and that your midwife is prepared to address those things due to the training that she has gone through. There is no such thing as a risk-free birth, whether in the hospital or at home. There is no such thing as a birth with no risk. There just isn't because life is inherently risky. Birth is also inherently risky. So you will have to make a decision whether you're having a birth with a midwife or an unassisted birth or a birth in a hospital about what are the risks that I am most willing to live with and which out in which situation would I have more regret if I were to have what we call a bad outcome, meaning an injured or deceased baby? Where would there be more regret for you? Which risks can you live with? But don't buy in to the thought that the hospital eliminates risk because it does not. Um, and nor is the hospital in some cases even more well equipped to deal with the things that might come up in labor. There are a few things and you there are some things that legitimately you need to transfer and you need what only a hospital can offer. Um, but that's pretty dang unusual. And a midwife, a good midwife will know how to get you to that help safely and promptly if it is indicated. Okay. 